I'm going to be showing us today uh, work from my latest uh, solo show, and the title is Orb, and I'll talk a little bit about the meaning of that as we go along. So um, we can just start at number four. There's a, there's a piece above us here, and uh, you'll see that uh, there are uh, abstract uh, figurations and a little bit of natural elements. I, in here, there's a, I've actually used a real leaf to slightly imprint, and then there's a lot of space. So one of the uh, important elements in all of my work is the use of space, and I don't call it negative space. I know in art school you're, talk, you're taught that you know, to use the word negative space. So I think this is a ridiculous idea. Space is space. So for instance, I study uh, Japanese flower arranging, and behind me here's a, an arrangement that I, I did today. And for me, the, the ability to be able to see something has to do with the fact that there's actually space around. So in the same way, I uh, approach a lot of my art making, <coughs> excuse me, so that there are gestural parts there are parts that are colored and less colored. There's a sense of tonality and lots of space. So even in something like this, this is a, a slightly older piece. This is called Fire Over Water. So the, the feeling of the piece is that it's um, quite dense. There's this feeling of overlay and maybe some foreboding because there's quite dark colors. I've purposely mixed in uh, some pumice into the medium so that the layers of uh, paint and the textures actually uh, go from the surface. So this part stays on the surface and then we go back into space. And one of the one of the treasures of the Japanese paper, the good quality handmade washi, or Japanese paper, is that you can uh, put one color down and just wait a short amount of time and then put another color. And you won't get this muddy thing that happens. You'll actually get uh, overlays and subtleties. And I wish I could say that I did that. I, of course, am responsible for it, but it really has to do with the substrate, with the support, which is the washi, which gives us all of these really delicious kinds of qualities, including here. So for instance, you'll see that um, there's a quite bright burnt orange area here. And then if you look closely, you'll see the edge. There's this crenellated edge. And th that has to do with the density of the paint going on to damp paper. So these pieces are all wet into wet. They're done in one sitting or standing. Uh, I don't go back and switch things or rub things out, unlike, uh, for instance, oil painting, where you can do that. What you see is what you get. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You have to scrap it. So here, there's all these beautiful things that happen. And even though over here, this is the same kind of rusty, burnty orange because there's a lot of water in it, hits the paper, you get the outline, the uh, crenellation of the shape of the droplets, and then the uh, the surface stays. So there's a little bit of metallic, so that stays on the surface, and then you get this blending, blending, blending. So for me, it's extremely satisfying to be able to work on this kind of paper. And then when I want something to stand out and to be dense, this would go on relatively later. So there's you'll see when when the, you have a sharp edge here on the uh, gesture that. Uh, there's a lot of pigment, and so the pigment stays, and there's a little bit of dropping down, but unlike here, where you get this sideways bleed. And really, um, even though I've been working uh, many years with washi, there's always a surprise element, and I kind of welcome that, because it really uh, invites me to pay attention and to watch. You can't go off and have a cup of tea. You have to be right there with your piece, and you wait until all of these things happen. So really, as the artist, you are, you're uh, out of control. You're in control, out of control, because there are many, many things that will happen because of the, of the, uh, the pigments, the amount of water, uh, the temperature of the room, etc. So there's a lot of um, 
serendipity that happens. So some of the other pieces are uh, banner pieces. And for this particular show, there's a few of them that are a little more constructed. And what I mean by that is all of these individual papers have been uh, hand dyed and painted, usually on very big sheets. And then I make a selection, and I start to pair and match them up until I get something that's very pleasing. And all of the papers are uh, handmade. And they're different. So this particular paper, this one here, actually uh, comes in this kind of beige tint. Unlike the others, all of the others are, are white or, or uh, tints of white. And they've been hand dyed and, in some cases, crinkled and um, made to, to be quite, quite textured. Uh, alongside of uh, some of these paintings are, um, so, excuse me, of, of these banners, are these smaller paintings, which I'll talk about in a minute. So if we go across the room this way and look at this piece. So uh, this piece is a, is a very good example of really trying to use the space of the paper to uh, use a few gestures and to really allow the pigments and the water and the fibers of the paper to, to come together and, um, how should I say, create the environment for something to happen. And again, as the artist, of course, we're the person who's actually doing the activity, but it's much less about control than letting go. You do something and you let it go. So for instance, in here, the original gesture is, it can be traced by the, uh, the outline and the imprint of the metallic quality. And then what happened, so the, so the metallic was mixed in with the blue-black. And then, again, because it's so absorbent, uh, there was all this bleed that happened. So, so all of this happens on its own. And you have to stand there and just kind of wait and say, oh, what's going to happen next? And not touch it. So that's part of the challenge, is you do something, and then you have to take your hand off. And then the other colors come in concert. So I, I have a number of. Uh, pigments that I um, prepare in advance, and uh, I just choose one after the other. I don't necessarily in my head know, oh yes, this is going to be thalo turquoise with uh, 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 a certain kind of red. The pigments are there, and it's really in the moment. So I do the first gesture, and then looking at the gesture, I decide, okay, what's the second thing I'm going to do? And the first movement on that canvas or on that paper for me is very important because that's that's your first statement that's your first energy it can be soft it doesn't have to be bold but it has to be definite there can't be any fudging if you feel like you're fudging maybe you should clean the house instead that day so behind us there are some tiny ones tiny little banners and again all of these are made by um with the exception of this paper, which is, uh, comes like this with the mica, everything else was white and then I, I dyed and then tore up and made them into these s smaller pieces. So I'd like to actually uh, talk about the combination of this canvas and this painting. Um, after my last solo show at Gage, which was about 10 months ago, I started to, uh, to uh, think about and feel the sense of what happens with using uh, pigments that are very closely uh, toned. So, for instance, if I walk along here, along the painting, there's a change that will happen, and there's actual pigment here that when you stand in front of the paint, painting, you may not see it at first. It's so, it's like a blush, it's like a breath. So I started to, to um, create these uh, works on canvas, and uh, they are, there's a, uh, a special gesso, that there's raw canvas, for number one, so it hasn't been, there's no gesso on it. 
but there's a clear gesso that you can prepare the canvas so there's a lot of tooth. So meaning that there's a lot of texture there and which, when you put down your pigment, uh, the pigment doesn't resist the canvas because of course canvas is very different than paper. So I did a number of these and in my mind I saw the show as being a number of these paintings very, very large and expansive with big gestural qualities but close tones, almost not there. At the same time, paired with a number of paintings like this. So at the same time, I was doing these paintings. I was doing, and this one's actually one of the larger ones, there's, there's uh, two sizes smaller, where the, the pigment is very dense, the color is very, very dense. They're almost a little bit difficult to look at. And they're very, very gestural. And for me, it's the, the difference between, so here, where you're looking up into space and you're imagining the world hovering in space, therefore the title orb, that's where that comes from. And the kind of planetary things that happen and the energies that happen in kind of big sky. And here is the reverse. You're walking deep into uh, the jungle or deep into the forest and you look down and what do you see? You see all this plant matter, dead, living, and it's all a big jumble. But in that, there's a certain kind of beauty. So I started to do these really uh, heavily textured. And uh, again, here I'm using uh, a very coarse pumice, really to, to, to pull up this kind of textured feeling, textured feeling. Some of the other pieces, uh, this one, which is called Heron, and the little branch is sitting in front of the Heron. <laughs> um, and these two pieces, uh, the actual banner part, I did as an abstract painting. Lots of ink, there's a little bit of uh, acrylic paint. And then what emerged for me is a head of an animal, so here, there's this eye, so this is if you think of, if, if we doubled it over. So the horns, the animal here, this is the, this is the snout. And then the same thing here. So this is called ram's head, so there's a feeling of... So, so sometimes the titles, even though they are abstract pieces and they come from really abstract place, uh, without knowing it, sometimes we, we uh, fall upon or we call up imagery that we're not even aware of. And for me, it was like, because I never thought, I thought, mm, this looks like a ram's head, as opposed to, oh, I'm going to paint an animal. No. So for me, it's quite exciting, because I feel as if that um, there's perhaps a lot of mystery and misunderstanding around abstract art. Uh, art comes from some place. It comes from, even if there's no immediate recognizable image, it's coming from somewhere. And so uh, for many artists, it's coming from their interior experience. By the same token, we can't help but acknowledge that sometimes things show up. And when they do, for me personally, I find it very exciting and very interesting. So now, I, then, then what happens is I think, of, I think, okay, where is this coming from? You know, why is it? And of course, there, for me, there's no particular answer. It's, it's more like, okay, where is this coming from? But then it makes me think about the possibility of doing other paintings that actually call uh, into the work this kind of animal nature. So not necessarily that it's going to be a bunny or a cat, even though I like bunnies and cats, but uh, calling in the energy of animals. So, so for me, again, it just opens up this whole other area of possibility of sources, you know. So uh, like many people living in Victoria, I love looking at um, videos of orcas and all of the things that happen in the ocean. I'm mesmerized. And, and particularly when you see there's a human being and then you see the eye about this big, of this thing that is so big that we can't, we can't imagine, and the fact that there's human beings that are side by side with these mammoth, huge living beings. So for me, it, it's like, even if I don't set out to paint the animal world, 
it comes to me anyway. So I'm very grateful, you know, and very happy because, as I say, uh, you know, I've been uh, privileged enough to uh, live as an artist and to be a teacher for, um, I hate to say it's more than four decades now. <laughs> um, and to be able to feel that life is rich enough, you know, I don't have to look too far for inspiration. All I have to do is go outside. All I have to do is turn around and look at plants and flowers. And if I'm, so this is the part where my contemplative practices come in, both my yoga and my meditation, is that when I actually do those things, and there are times when I don't do, do either one of them very much, but when I'm actually practicing, what it does is it gives me uh, a connection to space. So what's the first space? The space is the inner space, the space of the breath. So you sit and you wait, and you wait for emotion to come and ideas to come, and the laundry list and everything else in the space of your life. And after a while, all of the, the extraneous things start to settle. And what happens? You have another kind of experience of space, of you sitting, being in a room, and, you know, the, the light is still there, you're in a familiar place, or you could be outside walking, it could be the same thing. And what happens is you're stimulated by things outside of your, your interior space. So now your attention goes from inside to outside, and then from outside to inside. So there's this constant kind of renewal and um, energetic movement that goes on without our effort. We just have to show up. But the trick is, and, and for, for me, the um, challenge, because I'm a very um, busy person, and uh, there's a lot of things that are important for me to do, um, but when we can actually take time to stop and to settle, and to address inner energies and inner space, then the outer energies and the outer spaces, and I don't just mean cosmically, but just space outside of our own kind of world, they become available to us. And I think uh, for anybody, any person, because all people are creative, and it can be a kind of gift to your life, and it gives you space and a place to contemplate.